Lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio, here with James Jacob Prash in England, live via Skype. Jacob, one of the believers, had the question, based on John 20, 23, wanted the correct interpretation of this verse. Does the church have the authority to forgive sins? I was under the understanding that sins can only be forgiven by grace through faith in Jesus' finished work and by his blood spilled for us. I'm confused about this verse. As always, a text out of context, in isolation from co-text, is always a pretext. Auricular confession was a practice of ancient Babylonian paganism. Like so much else, it came via the city of Pergamum into the Greco-Roman world, and then was adopted by the paganization of Christianity, following its Hellenization that became things like Roman Catholicism and so forth. But in the original context, it was this. He breathed on the apostles and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Now, he was talking specifically to the apostles, but this is a general truth. What does it mean? When we lead someone to Christ, when they pray, and ask Jesus to forgive their sins, accepting that he died in their place, taking their sin to give them his righteousness, that he died their death to give them his life, and their spirit comes into them. Notice he breathes and receives the spirit. When somebody is born again, the Holy Spirit comes inside of them. At that point, Christians, not the church as such, but the church being the people in it, Christians, based on the authority Jesus gave to the apostles, we can pronounce somebody born again if they have had the Spirit come inside of them. If they repent, they're saved by grace, justified by faith. God puts a new Spirit inside of them. At that point, on the authority of the Word of God, written by the apostles, we can pronounce their sins forgiven. But we also have the authority to tell unbelievers that if they reject the gospel, their sins will not be forgiven. They will not be forgiven by good works. They will not be forgiven by belief in other gods. They will not be forgiven by ex opere operato sacramental rituals. They will not be forgiven by mass cards. They will not be forgiven by scapulas. They will not be forgiven. Only regeneration, second birth. When somebody is saved, Jesus breathes on them. When you were first born again, Jesus himself breathed on you. My sheep hear my voice. We frequently revert to the illustration of the resurrection of Nazareth. This explains evangelism perfectly. I believed foolishly that the Lord showed it to me once when I was at the traditional site of Lazarus' tomb in Bethany on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. But in fact, George Whitfield said the same thing 300 years earlier. <laughs> I wasn't so enlightened as I somehow imagined, even though I was correctly convinced the Lord showed me what it meant, I was not the first one or the only one. Upon resurrecting Lazarus, Jesus says, roll away the stone. Tells the apostles, roll it away. Then he says, you unbind them. 
But in between the two, roll away the stone, you unbind him, he says, Lazarus, come forth. Only the Son of Man can call that which is dead unto life. When we preach the gospel, all we are doing, giving out tracts, preaching the gospel, all we are doing is rolling away the stone. We're making it possible for them to hear the voice of Christ. Only Jesus can call the dead to life. When they come out of the tomb, this fallen world is. Then comes things like discipleship and so forth. You unbind them. When somebody's saved, when we witness to them or preach the gospel, it's not good enough for them to hear our voice. They have to hear the voice of Christ through the scripture. God in his grace may be using us, but they must hear his voice. They must be convicted by his spirit, and a clinktos must take place. If they repent and believe, Jesus breathes on them. His spirit comes inside of them, and they are born again. At that point, we can declare on the authority of the word of God that their sins were forgiven. At the same time, if people reject Christ, if they reject the true gospel, on the authority of the word of God, we can declare to them that their sins are not forgiven and will not be unless Jesus breathes on them. And he will not breathe on them unless they repent and believe. Forget the Roman Catholic myth of confession. When you look at the book of Acts, the history of the early church, when you read the epistles, the apostles never taught such garbage. Remember, the epistles are sanctified commentaries. The epistles explain the Gospels and other scripture. They explain the teaching of Jesus and what he meant. If you want to know what Jesus meant, read what the apostles say he meant. If you want to understand the Olivet Discourse, the return of Christ, what did he mean in Matthew 24, Luke 21, read 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians. If you want to understand the Lord's Supper, read 1 Corinthians. If you really want to understand um, the book of Leviticus, read Hebrews. If you want to understand these things, read the epistles. The epistles explain the rest of Scripture. The epistles explain the teaching of Jesus. No place do the apostles teach sacramental confession. Not only that, but we have the historical record, the inspired historical record of the early first century church in the book of Acts. These things were unknown to the early Christians. They're all nonsense, largely copied from paganism, invented and adopted and incorporated into Roman Catholicism for reasons of control. Not control by the Spirit of God, but control for political, and financial, and theocratic reasons. That's what the sacraments are, that's what confession is. What the Roman Catholic doctrine of confession does, as it does with all of its sacraments, it takes the authority of salvation out of the hands of Christ and puts it into the hands of a corrupt, pedophile-protecting religious institution. That's what it does. That's what it is always done. It usurps the authority of Christ and puts it into the hands of a false apostate antichrist church. That's what it does. Now this is not to say that the Roman Catholic Church is the only false church or false religion in the world. It isn't. Eastern Orthodoxy is no better and liberal Protestantism is worse. Nonetheless, it is false. It is not biblical Christianity, and salvation does not come by sacraments. It only comes by regeneration, by second birth. You must confess and believe and repent, and he will breathe on you. That is the true gospel. At that point, your sins are forgiven. For those who do not repent and believe, he does not breathe on them. Their sins are retained. 
Thank you for your question. My name is Jacob Rash. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen. Will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo. What the scripture actually teaches about the rapture. The snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo. All available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.